אהלן וסהלן פיקום, במדינת תחתא, סנט בול, יסמין נייג'ל בארי, על מסעול אל סור, ועל מוקף הנשיא של אלקטרוניק על עלמי, ועל סנט פול אמנק. You guys know this is the whole thing's happening in Arabic, right? <laughs> Especially you, Kathy. <laughs> My name is Nigel Perry. I work for the St. Paul Almanac. I'm the web editor and the photo editor. And we welcome you tonight to the Lower Ten Reading Jam. If you see something, say something. It's good to see you all here. If you're interested, our books are on sale up at the counter. $14.95, still good all year. And we want to thank the Black Dog Cafe for hosting this event. Um, they have a great menu, and there'll be refreshments all night. We'd also like to thank our sponsors. Uh, this activity is made possible in part by funds provided by the Lower Town Future Fund of the St. Paul Foundation, and with support from the St. Paul Neighborhood Network. SBNN airs our shows throughout the month on their cable access channel. We'd also like to thank Takumba Aiken, seated over there in front of the camera. <laughs> Takumba's an, uh, an artist about town, and he, uh, he does beautiful scrolls during the reading jams where he sketches each of the performers, and we'll, see, we'll get to see what he did live um, while it was live at the end. Tonight's show is curated by Misna. Mizna is a forum for Arab-American film, literature, and art. Since 1999, it's published the only journal of Arab-American literature in the United States and has produced the Twin Cities Arab-American Film Festival, sorry, Arab Film Festival, now in its eighth edition. Mizna puts on a variety of readings, screenings, and other cultural and arts events throughout the year with partner organizations and artists from near and far. Their recent writing workshop series is part of Salat, Arabic word for connections, a program also offering community dialogues for the Arab and or Muslim communities and fostering local creativity and self-expression, as well as investigating existing barriers to arts participation. They recently hosted their first writer in residence and will soon participate in the Northern Spark Festival with a participatory installation involving revolutionary Arab street art. Lower Town Intifada, it's coming. <laughs> I think that's on June 9th, June 8th. It's in this district, so come down. It's an all-night art festival. Um, I'm very excited to welcome Misna. Um, I actually had a piece published in Volume 1, Issue 3 of their, uh, their journal. And I know these people from way back when. And this is the only event where I've actually designed the website for the Almanac, Misna, and the cafe. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. I'd like to introduce Mohib Suleiman. He's our curator tonight for Mizna. He's an accomplished writer and performance artist from Egypt and the Midwest. He recently moved to Minneapolis to work with Mizna as a community liaison by way of Montreal, Quebec and with residencies at Salem Arts Work in upstate New York and the Banff Center in Alberta, Canada. His performance show, Habibi Albi is Not a Man, has played in New York City, Toronto, and Montreal at such venues such as the New Yorkian Poets Cafe, Barry Poetry Club, A Space, and the Montreal Arts Interculturelle. He has performed in and curated other solo and group shows and published poems and chapbooks. Moheb is currently working on an interdisciplinary project based on circumnavigating the Great Lakes by land and writing. Here's Moheb. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, Nigel, for that really great introduction and for introducing Mizna, because I don't have to do that all by myself now. Um, anyway, thank you all so much for coming to our reading tonight. Um, this is, um, you know, a really exciting kind of event for us. Um, we love be, being able to, you know, kind of interact with all kinds of different people, and uh, it's just so nice to see so many people that we don't normally see at our events. So, um, obviously, I'm going to make a pitch. Please stay in touch with us. You can, you know, find information about us um, on our table back there, and of course on Facebook and Twitter and um, Instagram, and you know, just on the internet. You can Google us. Um, 
Well, let's see. Since I don't really need to introduce Misna too much, I will, I will just say that you know, we kind of pretty much have two major programs. We have our journal, um, which you'll see back there too. Is that right? Yep. Um, so we've got copies of that if you're interested. And um, you know, the readership and um, the, the writership, I guess, is you know, local, national, and international, and we're really proud of that. Um, and we also have a major um, Arab film festival that happens here. Um, and we just finished um, off our last edition of that to great success, really, really amazing movies. And as someone who just kind of moved here recently, um, even though I've known about the organization for a long time, I was just really, really amazed by the selection and had a really great time. So you know, maybe you can catch that next time. Um, so thank you to St. Paul Almanac. Thank you um, to Black Dog for having us here. We're really excited about that. And I need to let you all know that you're being videotaped. So you can all, you know, like wave to the camera right there, just so you know. And also please turn off your cell phones during readers. Um, that's, you know, kind of nice of you. Um, and so, okay, so our reading tonight um, mainly is coming out of our writing workshop series, which is something that I've been working really closely with here at MISNA. And tonight we've got two of our facilitators um, as featured readers. We've got Kathy Haddad and Robert Karimi. And then, <laughs> yep. And we've also got, um, I believe, six of um, our writers who have been participating in those workshops really pretty steadily. So it's just really amazing to be able to have them present their work. Um, you know, whether coming out of the workshops or on their own, they've just, you know, really kind of stuck together and have formed a really amazing group that I, I think will just become a really great writing group in the Twin Cities and, you know, hopefully lead to more readers and, and um, or writers and publishing and everything. So, yeah, let's give it up for the readers. Um, let's see. I'll just say something very quick about Northern Spark again, because I'm really excited about it, and I've been working with that project a lot. Um, you know the Union Depot is like a block and a half over there, and pretty soon it's going to be a fully functioning train station. Uh, it's a really beautiful building, and they're taking the summer to sort of um, you know, bring a lot of people in through this really interesting all-night arts festival that's happening, which is you know, a lot more like kind of wandering through a peculiar odyssey of an art exhibit than like an art fair. Um, in case you, you know, aren't familiar with the festival from the previous years. So um, Mizna's got a really interesting exhibit. We're going to be doing um, some uh, street art on the underpass of the Union Depot. You'll be able to kind of wander over to our space, and it's kind of evoking um, you know, Tahrir Square or other um, Arab revolutionary spaces in the Arab world. Um, you'll be able to come and actually take a stencil designed by Cairo artists, um, Chicago, Bay Area, um, who have designed um, Arab graffiti stencils, and you can come and use those sort of as a gesture of solidarity to you know, sort of the challenges and democratization that's been happening out there. So we would really love it for you to come on June 8th, and uh, we would really love it if you can try to support us in any way. We have um, an Indiegogo campaign that you know, we're trying to raise a few thousand dollars, a couple thousand dollars, um, to bring an artist from Egypt, actually, um, which would be a really amazing thing. Um, they, she would come and participate in the festival and give a talk. Um, and we have uh, some really great prizes, like stencils and other packages that you can actually take um, if you um, donate to this project. So, you know, take a look at it. Um, we'll have some like iPads back there with you know a blurb and our page and stuff. So, and now let me get started with the reading. <clears throat> um, I'm going to be um, reading some of my own work tonight. And and. Um, I also thought I might bring in, you know, some writing by m much more famous, popular cultural people that we might not sort of think of as Arab Americans. You know, maybe they're heavy on the American. I don't know. We'll, we'll see what you think. But I'll just start off with this one. Um, well, they're lyrics. You know, they're not. It's not a poem. But we'll, we'll see how it comes across as a poem. And I think you'll be able to tell who this is by. Uh, within the first stanza. <clears throat> Ladies, up in here tonight, no fighting. No fighting. We got the refugees up in here. No fighting. No fighting. Shakira? Shakira. I never really knew that she could dance like this. She makes a man want to speak Spanish. Como se llama? Bonita. Mikasa, Sukasa, Shakira, Shakira. 
Oh, baby, when you talk like that, you make a woman go mad. So be wise and keep on reading the signs of my body. <laughs> and I'm on tonight. You know, my hips don't lie, and I'm starting to feel it's right. All the attraction, the tension. Uh, don't you see, baby, this is perfection. <clears throat> hey, girl, I can see your body moving, and it's driving me crazy. And I didn't have the slightest idea until I saw you dancing. And when you walk up on the dance floor, nobody can ignore the way you move your body, girl. <laughs> and everything's so unexpected, the way you right and left it, so you can keep on shaking it. Oh, baby, when you talk like that, you make a woman go mad. So be wise and keep on reading the signs of my body. And I'm on tonight. You know my hips don't lie, and I'm starting to feel you, boy. Come on, let's go, real slow. Don't you see, baby, Asi es perfecto. Oh boy, I can see your body moving, half animal, half man. I don't, don't really know what I'm doing, but you seem to have a plan. My will and self-restraint have come to fail me now. Fail, now. See, I'm doing what I can, but I can't, so you know, that's a bit hard to explain. I never really knew that she could dance like this. She makes a man want to speak Spanish. Como se llama? Bonita, mi casa, su casa, Shakira, Shakira. Oh, baby, when you talk like that, you know you got me hypnotized. So be wise. And come on, read the signs of my body. I'm on tonight. See, my hips don't lie, and I'm, I'm starting to feel you, boy. Come on, let's go. Real slow. Baby, like, uh, this is uh, perfecto. You know, I'm on tonight, and my hips don't lie. And I'm starting to feel it's right, the attraction, the tension. Baby, like, this is perfecto. No fighting. No fighting. I forgot one phrase. Um, I never really knew that she could dance like this. She makes a man want to speak Lebanese. Shu esmek, Jamila, Betty, Betek, Shakira, Shakira. <clears throat> Thank you. So, you know, that's um, one of our um, Lebanese American, that, that's, that person's within our entourage, you could say. You know, that's a Lebanese American writer, performer. You might want to check her out. She's on YouTube and all over the place. Um, but before I introduce our first reader, I'd like to read some of my own work. Um, this first poem is to my sister, who's not here. She's really far away. You'll see where. <clears throat> I couldn't move slow enough in the waves at Ka'ana Pali to keep our walk back from ending. Amira. And anyway, we were busy talking, slipping past each other, swell of each tide. The miracle be walking in water, immersed in that sir, so fine, salty, and real, blow the world. We did it. We walked in water, up to our face. Looking at you, skipped to know I looked like you. You stubbed your knee on a rock. Imagine how close and foreign is the sovereign world underwater. It let us touch a while without occasion. It was the matter between us. Its very air is water, and taken in in doses too rich for our palates, but perfect as a proxy for our very clothes and for our affections. The slipped off sleeve, the breeze, found underwater as the hugging leg of a pair of jeans, the current, the breeze's sibling, verifying that that first sibling so very real. I felt the ocean on my arms for hours after, and you at their length. I wished I'd performed an act of magic to bury our little walk more fittingly, have warded back and clapped my feet like they were under attack to reveal a lay of melon-scented Pua Kenny Kenny flowers wrapped around my ankles. A perishable totem from Maui and the Pacific to you, and to me, to be able to give that to you, there in the torpid waves. If that would have happened, would you have let me lay it around your shoulders? Unburnable one. Little Cleveland Cavalier. Maybe not. We're not so worshipful or fancy. We talked about dinner, dad, dessert, and your life in Hawaii. And when would we meet up later? In life, the current flowed. 
and to blow, the breeze has its own tense to do. In the past, blue, me and you walked in water. Thank you. I've got one more short poem for you, and then I'm going to introduce our first reader, uh, Jenna. <clears throat> A short life such as this is free, quented by bees. This is a short life. It's a sweet life. One on the wrong side of the tracks from strife, where the wildlife is a fix of a strange light. Bright, but gray like today is. Bright, but gray like today is. How's it fair? How's it fair weather only holds me together? I don't know these streets. I don't know these streets. I always see this park. I always see this park. I don't know this part of me. Well, does wildlife, does the wildlife thrive or does it just survive? Is there a love? Is there a love that's unhuman? That's what we'll have some of. Thank you. <laughs> Jenna, I don't know how to say your last name. Shalomit. Shelomit. Jenna Shelomith was born and raised in New York City and in a red pickup truck named Betsy. Yeah. <laughs> with roots. With roots spanning over two oceans and a sea, Jenna is a revolutionary who finds herself working for the government and other dichotomies. So let's please welcome Jenna up to the stage. All right, I'm paving the way for the other poets that are shorties. So hi, everybody. So I want you to take a minute and meet a neighbor that you don't already know, because we're going to be together for a little bit. So turn to someone you don't know, tell them your name, and something you like to do for fun. It'll help me feel less nervous. So I also have um, one of my best friends here who has a babysitter waiting for me to, yeah, <laughs> exactly, they're enjoying each other so much, it's so good. Um, so my, one of my best friends has a babysitter waiting on me to finish reading, so I'm going to interrupt you now and uh, acknowledge that we're on native land, we're on Anishinaabe land. Um, Arabs know something about land and our connections to it, so I want us to all acknowledge that we're on someone else's land. And I also want to say that uh, my first Salat workshop that I went to uh, was a fabulous day with Andrea Asaf. And that morning, I heard that a dear friend of mine, Brendan Lacey Campos, had killed himself. And um, the workshop was an amazing place to land after learning that a fierce, queer, black, local poet had died. And um, here we are, and I'm thinking of Brandon, and I'm also thinking of um, this amazing town that I live in. I work here in downtown, and the Wabasha Bridge was recently renamed the Freedom to Marry Bridge, and we're the first state in the Midwest to say it's okay for same-sex people to get married. <laughs> And um, we're at the end of Love is the Law Week. How awesome is that? So I've been bragging to everybody, and my Canadian friends are like, yeah, good for you. Eight years a little late, but it's fine. Go ahead and be excited about it. And I, I just want to acknowledge that a few days ago, um, Mark Carson, a black gay man, was shot 
on the Lower West Side of New York City, where I'm from, for being gay. And so I love uh, people getting to deeply commit to each other forever. Uh, I've done that with many people, and I love my life for that. And um, until we eliminate heterosexism, homophobia, racism, classism at the root, uh, we're, we're still under attack. So I love celebrating love, and we have a, a long ways to go with all of us here, with poetry. So on that note, I'm going to read you some stuff. Take this poem, my love, and fold it. Fold it again. Wait, unfold it. Hold it open to catch words tumbling from my mouth. Put it up to your, put it up to your face. Put it up to my mouth. Be safe. Come home to me tonight. I love you. You're my favorite. I like you, I like you, I like you, I like you. OK, now fold it. Hold it up. Be safe. Come home to me tonight. I love you. OK, fold it again. Be safe. Come home to me tonight. I love you. Now fold. No one told me when I came raging out of the closet at the age of 13 as a man-hating lesbian teenager who only listened to women's music, spelled with a Y, read books by women, spelled with a Y, dressed all in lavender and purple, and skipped school to play guitar and write poetry that I was taking a stand against something that wanted my love to die. I came out to live, to let my leg hair grow, to love queers, to dance, to enjoy my body, to connect myself to Audre Lorde and Pat Parker and June Jordan, Adrian Rich and Gloria Anzal Dua, Christos and where are my queer Arabs? Oh, here I am. I came to live out loud. So um, a couple years ago, I heard about this awesome guy who uh, Mizna actually just brought to be their first writer in residence, Ismail Khalidi. And I heard about him, and I was like, you know, he and I should be friends. So I called him up, and we became friends. And we wrote poems together, because that's what friends do, right? And so we wrote this really great poem that a bunch of my friends, uh, we were a nice little Jewish crew of people. We call ourselves Diaspora Mentality. Shotland's here, which is great. And he and I wrote a poem about being Arabs, um, me being Jewish, him not being Jewish, both of us being Arabs. How does that work? He's Palestinian. Oh my goodness, what's the deal? Can we be on you know, the same stage at the same time? So we wrote this poem. And this is, he's not here. He's back in New York City. And so I kind of reworked some things so I could still tell this story without him being next to me physically, but always with me. It's called Salt Sand Water. Turn a corner towards the sea, and while Lydia uncurls to reveal the lagoon at its center. Remembering me like an old friend that I haven't met yet, crescent of butterscotch colored sand loops at the southern tip of lagoon, protected from the crashing Atlantic by a barrier of rocks that catch all the violence of the ocean. Slickly wet-suited children surf in miniature waves, and teenagers play football among jalaba-clad women, making sandcastles with their babies on a stage like Central Island, which evaporates and re-emerges with the tides. It never looked like the same beach twice over the days that I was there. Silver at night, the water was lilac in the rising morning. Migrating pink flamingos land here on the way from Spain to sub-Saharan Africa. Elegant sandpipers and curlews, herons marching their lolloping Egyptian walk through the sand, swallows dancing to the sound of minarets calling the boaters, the fisher people and surfers to prayer. When I float between wall and shore, the seawater makes my throat ache and burn. My feet dangle like seaweed, reaching for a toehold. I'm thirsty. Displaced again and again by the push and pull of the swells, what's underfoot keeps shifting. If I try to stand, bitter salt chokes me, invades my nose. I'm torn up by the roots. What I love is the only thing possible. To give myself over to the waves, let them lift me and set me down at a shore that is always changing. 
What is the name of that essential thing that seeped from our pores and left its fine white powder on the skin of our days? Here in Minnesota, you can see what happens. When you irrigate, salt rises, insistent memories pushing up through a multitude of hands, making an impenetrable crust that bankrupts the factory farms and poisons the corn meant for export. Honor history or starve. There is a road from Mali to Morocco where a thousand camels at a time carried sacks of salt, bundles of gold, tattered red cloths filled with the dates of Sigil Massa, 25 days into the Maghreb, at the edge of the true desert, is the city of Tghaza, where the roofs are made of stitched camel hides, and the walls, even the walls of the mosque, are made out of blocks of salt. Do you remember? We have been here before, you and I, and all of us, lifting it, scraping our hands on it, skin growing red from irritation, of so much harsh truth, blood singing from the act of eating each other's stories. You sprinkle a pinch of it on my bread. I let the sparking grains of it sweeten your fruit. Do you remember? We walked all the way from the Walata between the Sahel and the Sahara to learn this that we can build cities out of what we know. I have no desert sand to give you. The grains I grew up with coated my teeth. My dad, walking with me on the Coney Island boardwalk, would dip his fingers into the ocean and stick his fingers in my mouth. Taste this. It's where you're from. Look out over the water. On the other side is Africa. My name was not an oasis of dates and warm sand. Through people's nervous lips came Johanna, Joan, Jan, Joanne, even John. So I just love that you couldn't pronounce Shelomith. It's The Scandinavian, German, Norwegian lips of the Midwest were nervous. They didn't understand my questioning mind, my hairy legs, my unhesitating arm that shot up. Oh, I want to discuss history, philosophy, and I was always ready to dance. The sounds of my papu's oud traveled the Hudson River gathering fish he sold on a in a stand. The European Jews wouldn't let us pray with them, wash with them, work with them. So we traveled through the rhythms of pomegranate seeds and sweet mint tea. I have no stories of deserts, of oases fringed with dates, but for the moon over Damascus, for the shimmer of a hot wind, for the brown hamsa of your hand, I will trade you this coastline, these five greatest lakes, the rough ridges where each tide leaves its debris, the overlapping arched footprints of waves, the moist breeze carrying the scent of New York out to the sea, the gray line of buildings above the green line of rain, bartered language on the lips of every hopeful woman, man and child, the ahlan wasahlan of a lost daughter of the coast. Do you remember? We know what sand knows, that grain beside grain we are infinite, that in our embrace the outposts of conquerors sink and smother and lie abandoned how we grind down the edges of countries. Do you remember? We have weight. We have purpose. Whole continents of a new land in each other's hearts. This is where we have gathered. There are no borders, no detainees, no deportations, leaving their red tracks across this poem. There are only our hands, shadowed and strong in the light of this fire, Dipping from the silver at night, the water lilac in the rising morning, passing cups to quench our thirst. Thanks. Thanks, Jenna. Um, next, I'm going to present to you uh, Molly Ilian Carson, or sorry, Carlson. Um, Molly has a BA in communication studies from ASU, but was raised and currently lives in Minnesota. She's lived in Cairo, Egypt, and travels back often with her Egyptian husband. She was previously published in Love, Inshallah, The Secret Love Lives of American Muslim Women. So let's welcome Molly. Hi. 
This is my first time, so be gentle with me. <laughs> All right. So my first poem is called Red Rain, A Song for Syria. When it rains, it rains in blood. Red clouds descend and shake the earth. Hope hides in caves and shakes in fear. Yet here she lies with open eyes, as fragile as a butterfly. Sweet angel, come and take the pain. Bring life to burdened hearts again. And let us never cease to see that in our children hope roams free. Of tribal ties and politics, of sticky bombs and presidents. For when it rains, the fire comes. The skies burn down while hearts burn up. For all the sodden atrocities of all the deaths our children see, we must try hard to bring again the renewal of hope to the children of men. My next poem I actually wrote while I was living in Egypt in 2008, which was before the revolution. And I was recently back again in January, and it really struck me that even though so much has changed, it seems that everything remains the same. This poem is called Dates. The dates are hanging from the trees, and I, when reaching for the fruit, now find my hands have taken root in self-defense against the mutiny. An old man fights to swim the sea of inhumane humanity, of dogs and cats and flies and bats in history brought to its knees. My feet are set to sing a tune, but when I walk, refuse to move. Instead, they wander room to room in soulless, robbing ministries. And I, I only aim to please find me the quickest route to leave, but I see the metro has collapsed with disregard to best laid plans of power and money hand in hand to rid the arid desert land of burgeoning democracy. The dates are hanging from the trees, and I, when reaching for the fruit, now find my limbs have taken root in self-defense against bureaucracy. The dates are hanging from the trees, and I, when reaching for the fruit, now find my soul has taken root in self-defense against despondency. And this last poem is one that is about just being a, a white convert and, and how it can be difficult. And it's called Stupid White Girl. <clears throat> skip, hop, skip. She hadn't wanted this. Still the blue sky shone. Silly little white girl, who's going to take you home? Yet in the face of prying eyes, she flies, a walking contradiction of white skin and blue eyes, an all-American traitor with a headscarf and apple pie. Stupid white girl, did you think that this would fly? Skip, hop, skip, she never bargained for this, homeland security prone, brainwashed white girl, this place ain't your home. This is a land of pundits and secret drones, Islamophobia and wiretapped phones, She's a terrorist's wife, all right, guilty by denial. She's the Zeitgeist, the shiny white, authentic Islamic apologist. Tell me, white girl, what do you make of this? Explain it, white girl. Why are you a terrorist? Skip, hop, skip. She hadn't signed up for this. Existing all alone. Not quite, white girl. Where exactly is your home? She's Arab by association, but American by dislocation, and a wanderer by divine vocation. She's deep in her belief, seeking, praying, kneeling, growing, reaching, placing her forehead to the ground. Earnest white girl, stop to look around. You're dangerous white girl, because no one can tear you down. Skip, hop, skip. She never wanted this, but finally she knows. Silly white girl, no one will take you home. Silly white girl, they can't take away your home. Thank you, Molly. Um, next, I'm going to present to you William Noor. Uh, William was born in Nazareth to a Palestinian Catholic family. 
Uh, William came to the U.S. in 1974 at the age of 16 and graduated from Augustan College in Sioux Falls with a degree in English and education. He's published his work in Mizna, and he owes his love for life and food to his mother and his love for books and writing to his father. To his father. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my first poem is to my beloved, which is my home. Did you ever love me? You sent for me. You lured me in from far away, roused me with stories carried by the spice caravans regaling your unmatched beauty, your radiance, your riches, reciting your peaks and your valleys. You stirred within me a hunger, inflamed me with desire, O oh woman at the edge of desert sand. You sent me sweets, infused with the scent of rose water, laced with orange blossom, promised me milk and honey. And I, Majnoon, I, Majnoon, just could not resist. My destiny, my fate, was drawn to seek your love with the salt in your hair where you live by the sea at the edge of desert sand. I saw you first behind a veil of mist, rising from the Jordan, shimmering in the light of dawn, an illusion of the divine. You were bent down washing your hair in the waters of the Galilee. You may not have seen me standing on the opposite bank of the Jordan, but I watched the sway in your hips between Haifa and Yaffa. And as you attended the sunset over Mount Carmel, you did not invite me in and I waited. My heart pounding, motionless, I waited. I waited to hear you say, come in, my beloved. But it was too late to escape my fate, my destiny. You were just lying there in repose, in the dust at the edge of sand. And at once, I became your lover appointed, your worshiper anointed, hypnotized, baptized through your Jordan, and rising on the other side, I cleaved my body to yours, and I was instantly home. I sacrificed myself at your altar, joining you in the dance of countless ages, plucked your olives, pressed your grapes, tended your sheep, kept your fires. But a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. And I, Majnoon, saw him standing there, the new lover at the garden gate, coveting you, my beloved. Was it my turn to join your lover's past atop the mound of bodies at your feet? At once, you have become mild and wild, my joy and my pain. Did you not love me back? And who will I be without you? Destined to live apart, hide the pain of a broken heart. Let it be known that I loved you more than life itself. If you ever see a man aimless in his walk, a broken heart in one hand, a handful of dirt in the other, shed a tear and send him on his way. It was his destiny, his kismet, to live, to love, to lose himself. Thank you, William. <laughs> um, I'm going to introduce Kathy Haddad next. Um, and you know, she's um, a big part of, of course, the uh, Arab American writing community here. 
Um, let me just kind of read what I've got here and say a couple more things. Kathy Haddad is a Lebanese-American writer, teacher, and community organizer, and co-founder of Mizna, where she served as our artistic and executive director for 12 years. Kathy has received numerous awards and grants from the Jerome Foundation, Minnesota State Arts Board, uh, an Archibald Bush Leadership Fellowship, and three Playwrights Center uh, Many Voices Fellowships. She's had several plays produced in the Twin Cities, including a staged reading of With Love from Gaza at Intermedia Arts, The Arabs in My Head at Theater Moo's New Eyes Festival, and With Love from Ramallah, co-written with uh, Juliana uh, Pegues, Peg Pegues, thank you, uh, produced by Mizna and staged at Mixed Blood Theater, and Zafira, the Olive Oil Warrior at Pangea World Theater. Kathy holds master's degrees in liberal studies and public affairs from the University of Minnesota, and she's worked full-time as a public school teacher in 1991. That's Kathy Haddad. She's been a great part of the workshops, too. I think everyone who's uh, read so far has been in your workshop, which was very recent. Um, and uh, you know, it was just really wonderful memoir writing, and we, we really appreciated that, too. So thank you very much, and let's welcome Kathy up. Thanks, Mohab and everyone. Um, yeah, I was uh, the executive and artistic director of MISNA for 12 years. I am not uh, any longer, and um, I just want to acknowledge Lana Barkawi in the back, who's the current <laughs> artistic director. Uh, MISNA is a huge part of my life. Um, when uh, we first envisioned a place for Arab writers, this is this is basically what it, what it is, and I'm so honored right now to be able to read on the stage. For all those years when I was directing Mizna, I really couldn't be a part of uh, any of the programs because I was too busy organizing them. So this is really a dream come true to finally be able to have the space and the time to be able to write. And this whole writing workshop series was really amazing. Um, there was a series of uh, workshops, how many, five or six? Six different workshops with, uh, master you know, writers, including Robert Karimi, who's sitting right back there, who's going to be reading later. Um, Joe Cotty, who is one of my heroes, um, and one of the first, actually, Arab Americans I met here in the Twin Cities, who, who uh, published Food for Our Grandmothers, the first Arab American anthology. So the Twin Cities has an amazing place for writers and for um, Arab writers. Um, so I'm honored to be here. So thank you. I, I led a workshop. Um, as Mohab said, but I also participated in, in several of the workshops as well. So, so I'm here to read some of the things that I wrote while I was a participant in the workshop, and actually um, a piece that I wrote uh, before the workshop that I wanted to share from uh, my play Zafra, The Olive Oil Warrior, uh, which was at um, Pangea uh, last year. Now, this monologue that I want to read for you is actually one that wasn't in the play. It was one that I wrote that I really loved, but we ended up cutting it when I rewrote the ending. So this is really the first time that uh, this monologue is going to be given. And if you didn't see the play, which um, I know Jenna's wearing the shirt there. <laughs> um, it's basically the story of an Arab American uh, school teacher turned superhero. Uh, and that's the, the short of it, but uh, this, is, this is one of her monologues. Um. <clears throat> when I was a child, I used to love to watch the grasshoppers in the summer. On long, hot days, I would sit on the step outside the kitchen next to the yellow marigolds and observe them as they clung to the dark green siding of my parents' suburban home. Their thread-like legs bent so neatly against skinny grasshopper bodies, the long antennas stuck out from alien-looking heads. Little black shiny eyes bulged. I marveled at how in one burst they could jump from the grass high into the air, stick to the wood, and then, like magic, disappear again. I imagined that they lived in a family with cousins and uncles and aunts, grandparents, that they had a little house somewhere where their mom was cooking grasshopper food and the kids were coming home after playing their grasshopper games to sit at a little grasshopper table. I wished I could jump like they did. Grass, house, sidewalk, gone. One sunny summer day, as I was quietly watching them, this jumping family, the neighbor boy, Petey Nelson, came over. I didn't really know Petey. He was older than I was, so it was strange he was in the yard. What you doing, Vicky? Nothing, just watching the grasshoppers. He didn't say a word. 
He just looked at the place where the grasshoppers were resting, their antenna twitching, eyes bulging, probably thinking about dinner or maybe going to play a grasshopper game. And he lifted his big foot and stomped it hard, crushing them to death. Their grasshopper juice ran down the side of the house, particles from their bodies stuck to the wood. He wiped his shoe on the sidewalk, laughed, and left. It was as if I had witnessed a massacre. I understood the world that day and my place in it. If Petey and his big white tennis shoe could casually stomp out life on the side of my house, a place he did not belong, a place where I was safe, and end lives that I protected, where was my safety? How would the future be for me, who was like a grasshopper, small and helpless? I wondered what it was that makes one person see a beautiful life and another find pleasure in ending it. Ever since then, I've been trying to take some of that power back, to stop the Petey's of the world sneakers in midstream. And now that I'm older and I have these powers, now that I'm Zaphira, the olive oil warrior, if he won't give up the power himself, I will take it from him. Thank you all for, for being here. Thanks for sticking around. Thanks for your attention and um, you know, just uh, participating here tonight. Um, I have a couple things I was going to say that I kind of forgot to say in the beginning. And you know, one is that if you're interested in taking an uh, Arabic class, Mizna is offering them. I can't remember the exact date that we start, but we have information back there. We have some pamphlets um, that you see Lena waving around over there. And um, yeah, so you know, we've got really excellent instructors. Um, the classes are small, and uh, everybody's had a lot of really good things to say about them. So if you're interested in that at all, just check, check it out with us back there. Um, another thing I want to say, too, for your, as far as participation goes, you know, our journal is accepting submissions right now for um, a food-themed edition. Uh, and the, the, the kind of the, the theme that we're calling it eating the other, and it has a lot to do with food appropriation, um, kind of, you know, where culture and food kind of run into risk or adventure or transgression. So if you are interested in um, working on that theme in any way and, um, you know, might have something that would be in some way relevant or related to the Arab American and or Muslim community, we would really love to read your work. Um, we have, uh, you know, an editorial board and, um, you know, we really do take the work seriously and we'd love to, to, to review your work and, and see what you have to say and maybe include it in our next issue. So I think we also have a paper back there that describes the, uh, yeah, there it is. Okay, so we have a paper back there describing the call for submissions. If you're at all curious, please check that out. And yeah, and also, like I say, um, check out our Northern Spark um, project too. And if, if you're interested, please do support the project through a donation. We've got some really great and interesting prizes. So all that is back there. Please check it out um, after our evening is over. So before we begin, I've got a few other things of my own to present. Thank you, Flo. Let's thank Flo and Lena, by the way, for being here and for all the work that they do for Mizna, right? They're really, it's just the three of us, and it could have gone so wrong, and it's gone so right. So, you know, we're, um, it's just the three of us at Mizna, and I really appreciate the two of them and all that they do. <clears throat> Let's see if you can recognize this. Lost in a dream, don't know which way to go. If you are all that you seem, then baby, I'm moving way too slow. I've been a fool before, wouldn't like to get my love caught in the slamming door. How about some information, please? Straight up, now tell me. Do you really want to love me forever? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> or am I caught in a hit and run? Straight up, now tell me, is it going to be you and me together? Oh, oh, oh. Or are you just having fun? Time standing still, waiting for some small clue. I keep getting chills when I think your love is true. I've been a fool before and wouldn't like to get my love caught in the slamming door. How about some information, please? Straight up, now tell me. Do you really want to love me forever? Oh, oh, oh. Or am I caught in a hit and run? Straight up, now tell me. Is it going to be you and me together? 
oh, oh, oh? Or are you just having fun? You're so hard to read. You play hide and seek with your true intentions. If you're only playing games, I'll just have to say, bu 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 bye do, do you love me? 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 I've been a fool before and wouldn't like to get my love caught in a slamming door. Are you more than hot for me? Or am I a page in your history book? I don't mean to make demands, but the word and the deed go hand in hand. How about some information, please? I've been a fool before. Wouldn't like to get my love caught in a slamming door. Are you more than hot for me or I'm a, I'm a page in your history book? I don't mean to make demands, but the word and the deed go hand in hand. How about some information, please? <laughs> Anyone know who that was by any chance? Paula Abdul, Syrian American. Don't forget. Um, before I introduce our uh, next three um, workshop readers and our um, featured uh, facilitator, Robert uh, Karimi, I've got a couple of poems of my own to present for you. <clears throat> These all come from a project I've been working on, incidentally, about the Great Lakes region. And um, I've been working on that for a really long time. Um, it's sort of exploring identity, place, and how um, natural geography is a really big part of um, cultural identity. Um, looking for kind of other ways to identify that sort of um, parallel race and class and gender and these uh, really predominant axes for our identity. And uh, I'm sort of using the Great Lakes region to talk about geography as a way that we um, relate to each other and to, to place and, and to ourselves. I don't arrive. The place arrives and starts a fire I am alive. I've been here a vigilant while. Wait on the risers by the shoreline. We don't arrive. I don't arrive. No thing arrives. Places arrive and start fires where there is some sign of life. I am alive. I am alive. Lake of the clouds in a boat bow finding superior through the carp's mouth. Porcupine, pountains, porcupine mountains in a ship's stern. See me now. See me now. Set to burn their hemlocks and maples. Apostle islands swimming by dried out Kiwana pasty crusts and mines. Tom's burned down cafe treading water. I am alive. I am alive serves as fodder for kindred places. Sault Ste. Marie twins test boundaries, crossing the rapids of the St. Mary's. Sue locks knee deep in the terrain and name. Come to me, come to me. Stoke the flames of their emigrations. The place arrives, places arrive. Collect and gather the fabled excess of the sum of parts, not discreet, no idea not as creatures or ghosts or the weather, a cordless power. It's not alive. They're not alive. A clap reversed. Big bang land. Bound down fire, bound down boardwalks like fire escapes. And there you are. You've been placeless all your life. You are alive. You are alive. The place arrives. Places arrive where there is a sign of life. You are on fire. This next poem is about a place that some people may know called Two Harbors on the North Shore. <clears throat> Losing myself in the man. Bragging to friend or family. Or brag to me. Motorboats coming in out the mist and fog like names returning to relatives. Sunset catches in their bow talk. The lake a burned down wreck hall of one colossal rusted jalopy of an ore dock toad beside. A fish this big says dad. A wallop like this punches uncle, well, brag to me. 
a sibling this giddy, no cooler a dusk since I can't remember. Brag to me, pulling the truck up and reeling the boat in, letting the fish go, always the one that got away. <laughs> well, I would marry you, family, just to be able to brag to Mrs sinking the sunset between the dishes and stacking them next to the tassinite ships passing the windowsill on taco night with smoked fish. A fly this noisy joke, boys. A tail this tall, yanking the young one against the wall and measuring the cow lick. Boy clears the silverware, collects all the agate rocks seen through the screen door, the two harbor skyline of sundown at the ore dock where me and mine lingered till dark. Not a ship to tear between the two of us, just a ride to share. <laughs> One foot driven into the lake and the other pensive as a passenger and the last two asleep under themselves like children. The tourist and work vista of Lake Superior. Remember that livelihood forever. A catch this lucky Hugs, Cindy. Well, brag to me. Brag to me, honey, baby, Bobby. Thank you. I've got one more for you uh, tonight before I introduce our other readers. Um, it kind of mentions the Sears Tower, which I guess is no longer the Sears Tower, but it's going to stay that way in this poem. It has a more corporate name now. I don't remember what it is. <clears throat> Let me just make sure I know it. Okay. Hmm, maybe I have it over there. Here it is. <clears throat> Sand gathered out in rows, dog doing laps in the water, and the city already game. The morning haze in its court. Seagulls and the day before last's news park and ride, park and ride. The little lot in the water quiet and untidy. The sun checks off the Sears Tower like a pupil entranced, glanced askance in bright black glasses. Up inside, you'd see it. This little pull off and put Michigan in the picture at the same off-balanced instant, looking out with a cloud's countenance, skimming the lake and having horizon to go. The periphery can be so capacious when you trace it, never even seeing the living in the loop lake rise go to work on its own three legs, south of itself, combing the beach, for example, or tempering the Wabash Avenue runoff with the glacials, grooming city life to nature's. This is the archetype of diversity. Even always seeing the lake through the saliva. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> Hopefully you'll be hearing a lot uh, more of that work. I'm, um, I'm working on a performance project on that. So um, yeah, maybe in December, I'll, I'll let you all know about it. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to introduce another reader for the evening. Sarah Tamer is a 20-year-old Palestinian who will be starting at U of M in the fall. She teaches a poetry and writing class to adults with mental and physical disabilities. In writing, Sarah is exploring how to put voice to her range of experiences. So please welcome Sarah Tamer to the stage. <laughs> Okay, the first one I'm going to read is called um, Palestine. I wrote this a while back, and um, I've only shared it with a couple of people, so here I go. Same story, but a new sadness has entered the streets of silent prisoners, prisoners scraping stolen lands for a piece of themselves, for a piece in themselves. A perfect line of white, 
unlike the doves in the sky, a line of bodies lucky enough to be found under shattered homes, tears pregnant with hate, tears forming into the rocks that make small fists clench up, rocks rejected by machine guns carried by pernicious hands. The very hands that raped and killed virgin blood dressing the city that was once dressed in olive branches, green with hope, now red with grief. To understand this place, you must understand its howls, its agony. You must understand why we unfold our prayers from our tongues, praying to unfold every occupied corner, while new corners of prisoners' mouths have dried up and formed a maze of brains and broken bones. Through the birth cry, small ears covered with the bloody hands of a mother who wears havoc as a nightgown, but she wears it like bones because there's no choice. It'll be the goddamn gown they muffle her in. Even the clouds are split in half and between the gaps fly missiles, a usual scenery. Streets with names unpronounceable, places visited by memory. This is what happens when the home lives within rather than living within the home. Um, the next one I actually wrote last night. It's really raw and unfinished, but um, it just happens to conveniently fall in with the theme. If you see something, say something. So I thought it was um, really cool how that worked out. So without further ado, I present to you, if you see something, say something. On my tongue lie horizontal lines of scars in the shape of my teeth. But my tongue has limited capacity, you see. So instead, I started to swallow my words like needles dipped in honey. This didn't work well. My windpipe irrevocably gave up on me in the small bathroom of a Thai restaurant. Everything is much more obstreperous in the stall. So when puke hits the water, liquid screams will spew and splash and echo and paint the tiles. Oral diarrhea. Involuntary personal word spill. And I lay there like pavement pizza, arguing with the worms. On Saturday, April 6th, I collected my disorderly pile of words and held them with mascara-stained fingers. I placed them under the sleeves of my sheer blouse and waited till I got home to tremor them out again. I've been casting my gory reality with innocence, but my troubles have molested me and chose a body to carry me in. Later that night, I heard the familiar footsteps on my staircase. They complemented my barely existing slow pulsed pulsation. Naked, encompassed by the words I kept, if you see something, say something. But she didn't, my angel. She took my words and I watched her lay like a butterfly, sporadically living in an ashtray filled with year-old cigarette buds, co-owners of words and secrets she now carries in the skin folds of her fragile body, while I carry the rest between the heavy lid hairs of my eyes, every blink a reminder that if you see something, say something. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarah. I don't know what you're talking about, being nervous, first time. What are you, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Um, I'm going to welcome uh, Nini Salem to the stage next. Um, I'm going to try to read the bio here. It's in handwriting, so I might have trouble. I'm sorry. But Nini Salem was born in, see, I'm already having trouble. Tianchen, Laos. She's lived in Paris, France, and grew up in 
I'm gonna, this is going to be like an, a Mad Libs with you and I. Born in Sharovia. See, I, I, I'm not from here. Oh, and grew up in Shorvia, Minnesota. Nini is a multi, I know, I, you know, look. Nini is a multi-talented artist. Nini is a multi-talented artist with a background in fashion design, makeup, event planning, music, and the fine arts. She's highly active in the community with a passion for connecting people and promoting the arts. Um, Nini's fluent in several languages and can be spotted around the city's best karaoke spots. That is true. That is true. So let's welcome Nini. Thanks everyone for coming, and uh, I want to say thanks to Mizna for these writing workshops. I was privileged to attend a Joe Cotty workshop and a Kathy Haddad workshop, and unfortunately I couldn't find some of the pieces from the workshop I wanted to share. So I have a piece that I'm sharing, and, and uh, unfortunately I couldn't attend Robert Karimi's and I wanted to, so. Um, and I'm not used to being in front of a mic reading poetry, maybe singing, but not poetry. Um, so I've got one piece, and it's short, but I want to do one really quick one, just so you guys can. So roses are red, violets are blue. I like baklava, and so should you. That's it. So, all right. <laughs> That's just, I'm a joker, so anyway. All right. Um, I tend to like to write about life and death and traveling and earth, so this is sort of my piece. And this is kind of from a trip from Morocco, so. Red sand clay, I feel you through the crevices of my toes. Warm, comforting, gentle, conforming to my feet as I press on you burdening you with my weight, mass, accommodating like a guest in your home. You keep giving as I keep taking, I indulging in the richness you behold. Forgiving, generous, maternal, you forgive me. You, vast and powerful, greater than all my atoms, stronger than my mind, faster than my wit, controlling my movements as I float above and through you. One soft step after another, toes, crevices filling with warmth. Exhaust, excuse me, exhaustion, contentment, death. My emotions and motions dissipates, slowly, sluggishly stops, but you, continue infinitely. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Nini. You know, the writing, the, the writing workshops have been a really uh, interesting and encouraging experience, I think, for Mizna because it's brought in a lot of really different um, people from the Arab American and Muslim community here in the Twin Cities. So. Um, I'm glad to see so many different people represented, I guess, on our stage tonight. Um, you know, having said that, I'm going to welcome Nemo uh, Farah up next. Um, I'll read her bio real quick. You might know. Nemo uh, H. Farah uses language to express things she finds too confusing. Part of her current undertaking is to develop her skills as an orator while blending Somali and English. She thinks herself charming and hilarious in the Somali language, often making herself laugh. <laughs> Me too. But rarely does that humor translate into English. It'll be magical when she learns to fuse the two languages together seamlessly. Let's welcome Nemo. Thanks, Ohef. What's up? What's up? <laughs> so I'm just going to do a quick poem that I wrote today on my lunch break. But before I do that, um, I took the Kathy Haddad um, workshop. Thank you, and Andrea Asif. And um, 
I'm doing an inroads mentorship program with Robert Kribe, um at the Laugh Literary Center. So yesterday he got us doing this exercise that I really liked um, about questions, um, asking questions to get to the root of your truth. I'm not saying it the way he did, but <laughs> anyways, I had tons of questions that I, I wrote down, but there are like four of them that I really like that, that I'll share right before I read this for you. Um, it's kind of like a dedication to Rumi. Why do I love dancing so much with my eyes closed? Is it so that I can twirl like a Sufi? Has twirling like a Sufi kept me from learning how to twerk? Do you guys know what twerking is? I'm not, I don't know how to twerk, but does anybody know how to twerk? Nobody? Somebody. Right there. <laughs> it's a dance. It's a popular dance. <laughs> um, has twirling like a Sufi kept me from, she's <laughs> like, me. <laughs> Be proud about your twerking. <laughs> has twirling like a Sufi kept me from learning how to twerk? Am I a loner because I prefer dancing alone? Is there a difference between being alone and being lonely? Okay, so I'm gonna um, read this uh, poem real quick. Uh, it's kind of, uh, it uses the word hijab, but I, I use it as hijabed with the ED at the end, just so you know, okay? So it's called half hijab. She's half hijab, she is a half hijabed woman. Hell broke loose in her Hoya's home. Hoya is mother in Somali. Hell broke loose in her Hoya's home. Mogadishu shed her mother's blood. Minnesota welcomed her. The new beginnings confiscated her mother's hair. She's still rooted in hope. With cold winters making her wish she was just passing through. But the grayness is a salve for her wounds to heal. She wears heavy clothes to cover up all of her scars. Saving for the American dream, she, fa she fantasizes, she has fantasies her fantasies have narrations in Somali with English subtitles. Too old to forget her mother tongue, too, last, too lost to pass through this land. Not all wanderers are lost, she tells herself. Here to stay, even though her mind is stuck there, the nomad now has a place to sleep, but stays awake at night in tall towers, scrubbing the floors of business centers. When they look at her, they see here and there, Half of her radical hair waves at them. The other half remains covered. She is the new, the old, everything and nothing. She is here and there. The half hijabed woman is a half-inated American. Thank you. Thank you, Nemo. We have one more guest tonight. Um, this will be our second um, workshop facilitator. Um, we had Kathy Haddad earlier, and uh, now I'm going to be really pleased to present Robert Karimi. Um, you know, another uh, really accomplished and um, really interesting um, interdisciplinary performance artist and uh, writer. So I'll read his bio, though. Robert Farid Karimi, critically acclaimed poet, journalist, educator, tragicomic genius, created the only live comedy cooking show featuring satire, storytelling, and food hosted by Iranian Guatemalan cook, Mer how do you say this, Robert? Mero, Mero Cocinero. Mero. <laughs> of course, Mero Cocinero. This alter ego has cooked for over hella thousands of people in 28 days of good energy, a culinary transmedia interactive experience in response to type two diabetes in at-risk communities of color, uh, which, has, um, which has Arizona State University studying the effectiveness of Robert's performance platform pedagogy on behavioral change relating to health and food. Robert is new, uh, is now the artistic director of The People's Cook, an organization that nourishes audiences through virtually live artistic and culinary experiences. We're really uh, glad to have Robert with us tonight, so let's give him a big hand. Hello! How are you all doing? Back row! Back row! Woo! All right, five of you, yes, good, I love it. Uh, my name is Robert Farid Karimi. I am really excited to be here. I want to give a big thank you to Mizna. Can we give a big thank you to Mizna, please? Um, I am trying to do a set. I have changed my set to fit everybody else's poems before me. 
So if you find it, it's like uh, you know a little highlights hide and seek thing. There is bad language, so I yeah whatever. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> I don't know if I've read this before at a Mizna thing, but I'm going to read it today because I need to. Uh, thi uh, this goes out to all the Harry Potter folks. You know who you are. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> and this is called No One Wears a Chador at Hogwarts. <clears throat> <laughs> By book five, I was missing something really bad. <clears throat> Do that again. <clears throat> there were muggles and magicians, and even Cho Chang. But when I watched Harry, Harry and Hermione and Ron scuttle away, scuttle away to get the honey beer, I realized no one wears a chador at Hogwarts. No one prays five times a day. They talk about magic and spirits all the time. So all spirituality should be OK. Everyone said not to be so sad. There's no yarmulkes or turbans or other other headdresses, they said. I was pissed off when they said headdresses. I know I said, but they celebrate Christmas, and the closest thing they have to something for the head is the Death Eaters, who are the only ones who cover themselves, and they represent evil. Damn. Does that mean kids from Somalia, Iran, Israel, and all these other places can't be magicians too? And I scream, no one wears a chador at Hogwarts, or yarmulke, or turban. No one prays five times a day. They could celebrate Yom Kippur and Ramadan, and even Diwali Day. All religions are as old as magic, each with incantations and rituals too. Why should only secular magicians play Kidditch or the Sorting Hat? I mean, Hogwarts isn't in France. They shouldn't ban the Chador or Hedjab. So I sing, no one wears a Chador at Hogwarts or Yamaka or Turban. No one prays five times a day. If McGonagall can wear a magician's hat, then a headscarf should be okay. Together, no one wears a chador at Hogwarts. No one wears a chador at Hogwarts. No one wears a chador at Hogwarts. And that makes me blue. Come on, J.K. Rowling, make that change. Uh, I am, I'm going to be reading uh, <clears throat> something for you that I've never been read before. Uh, you're hearing a lot of me because like, I was in Indonesia. I was surrounded, this is the most Muslims I've ever been in my life. I grew up in a primarily Catholic area with a Muslim father uh, who was Shia. So it was a very different experience than I think the majority of people I meet, I think still. Uh, and going to Indonesia was even another one. Like I went to the third largest mosque and that was across the street from the, one of the oldest Catholic churches. So I was like, whoa, <laughs> mind blown away. So, but the other thing is I watched a lot of movies. And I happened to watch this movie made by Ben Affleck about Iran. <laughs> it was tough. I did it. And I say to all of you that do not like a movie, watch it for free somewhere, and then talk about it. And here I am going to do this. So this is called uh, Argo Bleep Me, and it's all true. <clears throat> this is based on a true story. The Iranians pissed off at the CIA for Mossadegh's removal, hired Ben Affleck to make a movie about historical events so that the CIA could not feel so upset for meddling in the affairs of countries for the last 50 or so years. 
Everything was spliced, reimagined, pieced together in the name of peace. Later, Ben Affleck approached the Chileans because he loves that Latin lusciousness so much, and he thought he would be perfect to play a Chilean hero, offered millions of dollars to play the protagonist that downed Pinochet. Alas, Chile said no and hired Gael Garcia Bernal because even Chile knows that if you need your history to be sexy, hire a sexy Mexican. <clears throat> Salma Hayek. <clears throat> this is based on a true story. Chileans like hot dogs. Iranians like rice. Ben Affleck likes Puerto Ricans. Thus, Ben Affleck, Affleck likes his Puerto Rican hot dogs in between his Chilean and Iranians with rice. <laughs> this is all based on a true story. Now, Chileans no longer have dictators. Syria is roughly next to Turkey. I was born in California. I was beaten as a child. It's all true. Spliced, pieced together in the name of peace. Once upon a time, I hugged a president. We drank until midnight, talking about sex and decommissioning military bases and that he really liked cocaine a lot. It's true, based on a true story, yes. I had sex. The mayor had sex. I had sex with the mayor. You had sex. Ben Affleck had sex. You had sex with Ben Affleck. It's all based on a true story. I was a great lover until the CIA showed up, created a file on me because I was a child of an Iranian citizen and refused my father a security clearance. It is difficult to be hot and steamy when you are a target of racism. I think it was Gabriel, Ga Gabriel Gael. No, it was my friend Bezad who was uh, hooked up with a Jewish Scottish woman who asked her to tie him up, who asked him to tie her up. Then as they were having sex said, me like a terrorist. It's based on a true story. Ho hold on, hold on. I think it's my friend Ben. Can you hear him? It's Ben. He wants me to act in his next film about the Iran-Iraq war. Yes, yes, I know you're excited for me. It will be directed by him and Boz Lerman, and I will play one of three American hitchhikers stuck in Iran. And it's about Denzel Washington, who saves the three from the Iranians who are, who are uh, savagely killing Iraqis with mustard gas, ordered by the evil imam, uh, Saddam Hussein, who, uh, with his money from an evil character, from Libya or Cuba, played by the same guy who played Gandhi. <gasps> no, 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 it's Ben saying it's gonna be me. I'm gonna play that. I can't wait for you to hear my first line. Hidden American, go back to the womb of your whore of a mother. You kill our daughter with your stench. Leave from here, heathen devils, come. And then Denzel, get this, Denzel puts a cap, a garbage bag over my head and impales me. The studio told him that they're going to create a dish to sell all over America and maybe the world because the world eat what eats what America eats first called Arab on a Stick. Based on the movie, it's going to delight state fairgoers. It'll be spicy, exotic, and it'll have my picture. I'll be on the wrapper. I'll be famous. It'll be tasty. The computer, you're all going to support me, right? Because we have a product we all can get behind. Uh, and Michelle Obama will give me awards. And I will bring world peace because I'm a spokesman for Arab on a stick. And people will be eating a piece of me. And people will want to know more about Arabs and Persians. And, and no one's going to want to, no one's going to use the word, the term Middle East anymore. I know. I know what you're thinking. The meat flavor doesn't represent all of me. I know. There's going to be an intestine flavor and, and tongue flavor. And, and don't worry, it'll be organic, grass-fed, and, and no pork. They're going to keep it hella halal. <laughs> and it's because of the work I do with Ben Affleck. And it's entirely based on a true story. You can't refute it as long as the word true is there, right? <laughs> it's all true. Choose your fiction because that's the only truth. Thank you. I'm just going to do two more, um, and I'm going to give you a choice of the, of, of, of the second to last one. 
Um, uh, would you like uh, PO, POWs or 60 minutes? I don't know what the reference point for this crowd is. POWs or 60 minutes? No one? 60 minutes. All right. Mm -mm. What he said, right on. So uh, my father, uh, well, you'll hear the poem. Uh, I'll just let the poem explain itself. This is called The Wonderful 60 Minutes of Muhammad. Daddy never let me watch Wonderful World of Disney. He said that too many mice and ducks and sugary fantasy cause brain decay. And there is no brain fairy when you lose your brain. So I would crawl on the ground using my institutionalized training in my preschool of the Americas to covertly change the channel. <laughs> and instead, my daddy, my baba, the man with Iranian rallies in his pores, Western bitterness from CIA infiltrations, conspiracy theory heirlooms which make him make believe less in the make believe and all gods, real or corporate, said more with the remote control than his split tongue ever could. Click, click. Click, click. The voice on the television would speak for him. I'm Ed Bradley. I'm Morley Safer. I'm Mike Wallace. These stories and Andy Rooney on the next 60 minutes. The longest hour of my life. Tick, 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 tick. I wanted Pippi Longstocking. I wanted Donald Duck. I wanted 20,000 leagues under the sea. I wanted Herbie and his love bug, goofy Mickey Mouse. I, revolutionary in training rise up against my Baba's Persian patriarchy. We, the lover of Disney, shall overcome! My Baba corners me when I try to leave, turns me towards the screen, and like a good TV addict, I obey, sit, and watch. Because I believe any TV is good TV. Tick, 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 tick. Though I watch with a pouting face because I'm in solidarity with the M I C K E Y M O U S E. In school, every Monday morning, all the kids brag about their Sunday Disney pleasure. I would shoot back. Oh, yeah? Darrell Jeter, a man from Dallas, was unjustly accused of robbing a KFC because he was black, and Mike Wallace found out and got him out of jail. After I finished the last sentence, the boy in the third row cried. Someone countered with the coolness of the latest Goofy cartoon. I yelled back, Ed Bradley's expose on Reagan's secret war in Nicaragua proves that the government lied to us. Again, more kids cried. The girl with the braids in the third row. The entire second row near the crucified Jesus loudspeaker combo, all in tears. My teacher looked at me with a, I had just broken a commandment look, and she whispered, Robert, dear, Catholicism and politics do not mix in public. <laughs> she grabbed my ear, sent me to the mother superior, Sister Barbara, who suspended me for three days, asking me, consider the second commandment, honor thy parents, honor thy school, honor thy administration as my elementary school trinity. See, I said to my Baba as, he, as we drove home, this is what I get for missing Disney cartoons. He was not swayed. Click, click. On and on and on. Environmental messes, bailouts, layoffs, cover-ups in Laos, Vietnam, and Iran. My innocence lost by corporate scandal after scandal. I could not rid myself of the sound. I still wanted, if you wish upon a star, makes no difference who you are. My Baba's voice interfered. Robert June, vision is never appreciated because everyone sees the same. They are the cartoons they watch. It is better to be the art than watch the art. As I grew from boy to man, I did whatever I could to block out the 
The Muppets, comedy shows, sitcoms, Bart Simpson, Bart Simpson, Bart Simpson, until the day Ronald Reagan died. Tick, 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 tick. I watched the TV talk about him like he was Walt Disney and that his administration was the happiest place on, on earth. Hey, boys and girls, our favorite Mouseketeer is gone. Oh, even the people in El Salvador are sad. Oh, no. The clock grew louder again in my head. And I grew happy that my father had taught me not to be a cartoon. For now, I love the sound of tick, tick, tick. Thank you. Um, I, um, boy, I have so much to say, but I'm going to say, if you want to find out more about stuff I do, uh, you can just go to chaoticgood.com or just see me hang out. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you, Mizna. Thank you, Moheb. Thank you, Lana. Good night. Thank you so much, Robert. That was just great. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming, of course. Um, thank you to Khaldun for drumming. Um, Kathy, it was great to have you, and everybody else, thank you so much. Please take a moment to uh, drop by and see the materials that we've got back here. Um, and uh, we really would appreciate your support uh, in the near future for our Indiegogo campaign for our Northern Spark um, project. It's going to be really exciting for us. And of course, thank you to St. Paul Almanac and the Lower Town Reading Jam. It was really, really wonderful for having Oh, yeah, sure. Tell us about this. So this, is, this was um, sketched by Takumba Aiken, our resident scroll maker. He's a scroll maker. <laughs> Starts off with some handsome fellow over here. I'm not sure who that is. And... Um, the stories and words that sort of surfaced up um, are now recorded. We're going to leave this line down here, so if you want to come over and look at Tukumba's work, please do. Um, thank you very much. Um, there's a tip jar somewhere around. If you can donate to the Almanac, we'd very much appreciate it. Copies are over there. And thanks all for coming. Thanks. Whoop, whoop.